Educational psychologists have uh, done studies on children four years old and younger. And one of the things they have found is that a three-year-old child can learn things 25 times as fast as a fully developed adult. And one of the things that the research psychologists have asked is when is that time and why does that happen? Conclusion that they've come to is very interesting. And what they find is that it's at that time in that two and three year old period where the little child is constantly pulling on their mother's dress or their dad's pant leg asking, why dad, why is this happening? Why dad, what is that, why dad? And they find that that enables this very quick learning. And so as we ask the why question, when, and you remember what I said in the book of Hosea, that the why question is that question that moves us from the observation step in inductive Bible study to interpretation, asking what did, what did it mean to the original uh, writer and the original readers. When we ask that why question, that is the way so many things are opened up to us in the Bible. But it's not only the Bible, it's in reading regular literature. Mm. It's in uh, watching movies. There are so many things that we can do in asking the why question to further develop ourselves in inductive thinking. One of the things that I do when I'm teaching uh, inductive Bible uh, study in schools outside of the School of Biblical Studies is I will often give a homework assignment to the students from one day to the next. Let's say I'm somewhere for five days. Monday through Friday, I will tell these students, I want you to ask 50 why questions of your environment between now and tomorrow. So I will uh, get, the next day I'll get questions like, why is this particular sign here, for instance? Why is there a no parking sign in this part of the parking lot? Why is there a sign here that says you can't turn this light on at this time? And they just ask these kinds of why questions. And what I'm trying to do is to develop a particular uh, habit, to, to develop a particular aptitude in the students that when they uh, receive information that they don't just kind of be like a sponge and just take it in, but they receive information and they have an active brain when they receive it and they begin to ask questions around that information and the basic question that I encourage them to ask is why. So we want to do that here with these judgments on these various nations. So if you go back to Damascus in chapter 1 and verse 3, and God says, you know, you are going to get fire. And the question we want to ask is, well, why was that? And you find in verse 3, it says, because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. Well, to thresh something with a threshing sledge of iron, and it says Gilead, probably talking about uh, being harsh with people and actually running threshing sledges over them. You find that King David did this with idolaters. But it's appeared here that Damascus somehow did this in a way that was very unappealing to God. And the mark there, I think, that we're looking at is cruelty. And what God is saying to the people of Syria is, you know what? You have simply been cruel. And because of your cruelty, you're going to receive my judgment. Now, as we go through Scripture, what we find is that cruelty in every dimension is something that's condemned by God. So this would make sense, right? For instance, even in the book of Proverbs and in the Psalms, it talks about righteous people are kind even to their animals. When you think of cruelty to an animal, that the scripture says this should not be so, that we shouldn't even be cruel to things that are not made in the image of God. The scripture says that we should leave the earth and the environment in a way that was better than when we showed up here. It says in the book of Revelation that God is going to destroy the destroyers of the earth. Well, what does that mean? It's talking about people even being cruel to the creation of God, that there is a place where we are to consider this whole idea of kindness as much more than simply kindness, that kindness has to do with stewardship. When people are cruel, when people just destroy to destroy, it is a picture of a lack of stewardship. It is a picture of a lack of understanding who the creator is. And so God says, uh, Damascus, because you've been like this, I'm going to take you out by fire. And so we find then in chapter 1, verses 6 through 8, a parallel statement. For thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they carried into exile a whole people to deliver them up to Edom. Now this is apparently 
a picture of kidnapping with the idea of slave selling and trafficking in people. And today is such an important day in history where there is such an outcry around the world against human trafficking that we find in the book of Amos that God is making this statement about kidnapping and he's making his statements against human trafficking and slavery. It's very interesting as you look at slavery through the Bible. It's interesting that as you look at slavery in the Bible that God wanted his people, once they were out from under the slavery of Egypt, he never wanted them to go back to slavery again. You find in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 that the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians says, if you have an opportunity to get free as a slave, we'll take the opportunity, don't, don't remain a slave. And we find that the general posture of the Bible is that all people should be free. However, the Bible, because it deals with reality, also talks about slavery, and it talks about if a person is going to continue holding slaves, that there is a right and wrong way to do it. However, in Scripture, there was never a provision made for a right and a wrong way to kidnap somebody. In fact, in the Old Testament, when you think about what kidnapping is, basically kidnapping is stealing, right? It's stealing a, a person. It's stealing the image of God. And when you look at Exodus chapters 20 through 23, God made provisions for stealing. And the provision for stealing was that you would pay back what you stole with interest. Uh, very interesting that there was not much provision for people going to jail for theft in the Old Testament. The provision was, no, you pay back the person you stole from and you add interest to it. However, there was an exception to this. And the exception to that law was if a person stole the image of God, if a person kidnapped. And when that happened, the punishment in God's eyes was death. And so Gaza was to be uh, uh, visited by fire and God says this is what's going to happen to you because this is what you did. You practiced this, you trafficked in human lives and as a result of that you're going to pay a terrible price. Then we have the whole uh, city of Tyre here in uh, verse 9. For three transgressions of Tyre and for four I will not revoke the punishment. The question we ask is why? Well the answer is in verse 9 right down at the end they did not remember the covenant of brotherhood and probably that covenant had to do with relationships that they had with Israel and with Judah. And when we consider forgetting a covenant, what we find in scripture is that God takes covenants very seriously and most specifically his covenant through Moses with his people. And you have a picture here of God's basic attitude of being faithful to our word, being faithful to people who have been loyal to us. And God says, because you haven't been loyal, because you've forgotten the covenant, you're going to get fire. Then we have Edom here in chapter 1, verses 11 and following. For three transgressions of Edom and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because he pursued his brother with the sword and cast off all pity. Same thing as we have in Damascus. The Edomites were cruel. And God says, because of this cruelty, you're going to catch fire. Now, the picture here is as we're going to go through, further through the book, as God is talking to the nation of Israel. But he is giving, his, in some ways, as we look at these judgments that he puts on these surrounding Gentile people, God is also giving us a picture into his character, what he is really like as a person with people, uh, that he has not, shall we say, written out a covenant like he did with Moses. And what we see is the person of God, and the person of God is just fully uh, consistent with his covenant. So cruelty. Then we have the Ammonites. Very interesting with the Ammonites, 113 through 15. This is a terrible picture. Three transgressions of the Ammonites and four, I will not revoke the punishment. Why? Because they have ripped up women with child in Gilead. Just think about how cruel that is. Just think about what an ugly picture that would be to see people... Uh, ripping up pregnant women. That is an absolutely disgusting thought. And God says, because you've been that disgustingly cruel, I'm going to judge you. And he goes on, that you might enlarge their border, I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah, and it shall devour her stronghold. And their king shall go into exile. So it's a fire in exile. And the enlarging of the border there is greed. That they were probably where he's talking, he's linking the tearing up these pregnant women with enlarging borders, probably talking about killing whole families just to take their homes, to confiscate their homes. 
And God says, because of that cruelty, fire and exile is coming to the Ammonites. And these fires, by the way, when you look at archaeology, some of these fires that occurred in these areas were extremely hot fires. The archaeologists, as they look at them, basically at times it's almost like God turned these cities into ovens. Very terrible what happened to some of these people. Moab, you look at chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Three transgressions of Moab, and for four I will not revoke the punishment. Why? Because he burned to lime the bones of the king of Edom, this is desecrating and dishonoring the dead. So I will send a fire upon Moab that shall devour the strongholds of Kiriath. Moab shall die amid uproar, amid shouting and the sound of the trumpet. God says, I'm going to slay all of its princes. So it was a dishonoring of people. And very interesting as we consider that God, even among a pagan people, now we're not talking about people who had the light of the law of Moses, that, that they would understand even what it means to be made in the image of God. And God says, consistent with his character and his nature, apart from the law, he says, you know better than this that there is a certain sacredness to people, that, that, to, that to dishonor the dead this way is a terrible thing. Because you've done it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to burn you with fire. Then he gets very personal with Judah in chapter 2, verses 4 and following. And as you read this, it makes total sense. When you've looked at all the things these people have done, then you get down to the way God's going to talk to Judah. And what he says, we look at that and we say, well, yeah. Chapter 2, verse 4, for three transgressions of Judah and four, I will not revoke the punishment. Why will he not revoke the punishment? Because they have rejected the law of the Lord. And so the picture here is that there is something special about Judah. You have the law of Moses and you have rejected it. Notice what it says in verse 4. They've rejected it. They have not kept his statutes, but their lies have led them astray. They live false lives. They haven't kept the statutes of God. In verse 5, he says, so I'm going to send a fire on Judah. And what we know about this fire that came to Jerusalem when Nebuchadnezzar came in 200 years later, it was a very hot fire. Basically, the whole city was destroyed. The temple was destroyed. Uh, the people were taken away. There was cannibalism. It was a terrible, terrible circumstance. And God says, why did it happen? It happened because Judah rejected the law. Now look at the distinction that God makes between Judah and the rest of these people that he's talked about. God didn't say anything about the, rejecting the law to these other people. He talked to them about how cruel they were, about how terrible they were, about how bad their behavior was. But with Judah, it was something special. Not only was their behavior bad in that they were liars, but, but it was the fact that God had given them this great treasure he had given them this wonderful law, and they had cast it behind their back as if it was nothing special, and they disobeyed it. And God says, as a result of that, you're, the fire is coming to you too. Now, what you'll find as you get into looking at the history of Judah is that Judah behaved just like all these other nations did. And Jeremiah says it over and over, that they act just like all the other nations. But the, the real, shall we say, sin of all sins that the prophet here is talking about with Judah is rejecting the law. Then we look at what God says about Israel. It's very interesting, and it's very, shall we say, contemporary. And it's somewhat similar to what we find in Hosea. And in chapter 2, verse 6, For thus says the Lord, three, tra three transgressions of Israel, and for four I will not revoke the punishment. And what is the problem in Israel? Here it is. They sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes. What we see is the, pro the basic problem in Israel. Yes, they've forgotten the law, but the basic problem is oppression and injustice. And so what you see is these social sins that are happening in Israel, and God says, as a result of that, you're going into exile. I'm taking you away. And the really terrible thing about the exile in 722, and it was a terrible thing, is that physically, these tribes never came back to the land. There's just no historical record that they ever came back. So when, when God, shall we say, pulled the house down on Israel, uh, it was, they physically never came back. Now, spiritually, under the Messiah, they did come back. But physically, they never came back to the land. When they lost it, they lost it for good because of their oppression. And you find in verse 8, they lay themselves down beside every altar. So you have idolatry. And in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. And 
probably drunkenness and celebrating their other gods. And God reminds him in verse 10, I brought you out of Egypt, but basically you've forgotten me and you oppress other people. Verse 12, you made the Nazarites drink wine. You caused people who were truly committed to the Lord to become sinful in the way they behaved by your oppression, by your lack of godliness. You did this. God says then in verse 16, he who is stout of heart among the mighty shall flee away naked in that day, says the Lord. God says, as a result of that, I'm taking you away. I'm going, to, I'm going to send you to exile. So as we look at the opening comments here in Amos, and we ask the, the basic inductive Bible question, why, we come to some rather sobering conclusions. And we'll look at some more as we continue in Amos.